Hey, Andy. It's Audrey, Floyd's wife. Um, so I know you have a shtick, you know, you guys have your whole show and all of that, but honestly, like that whole thing where you take Floyd's shirt off and kiss him on stage, it's, uh, it's kind of fucking weird. And, uh, people are starting to ask me questions and yeah, um, I know you have a show to put on, but can you just cut that shit out? It's, it's fucking weird, Andy, please. Oh, hello, Andy. It's Hans. The German policeman who arrested you? I can't stop thinking about you since that day I pulled you off the scooter and took your blood from you and tested it. And I've been watching you, and I've seen you in your bass play on stage, falling in love and taking your shirt off, and I've decided I will clear you of all charges if you and Floyd invite me to make party with you. Please contact me back next time you're in Berlin. Just stay off the scooters. Alright, and we're live. Andy Frasco's World Team Podcast. I'm Andy Frasco. How you doing today? How's our heads? How's our minds? Are we getting, um, keeping the demons deep out of that um, brain of yours? I'm telling you, man. Depression and um, loneliness, it is really a weird, uh, it's a weird situation. They just hide. They hide in your brain, and then, right when you um, or like right when you stop thinking about it, boom! It just slaps you. I was going through a lot, um, and um, I think that's why I have a cold now because I finally was like, was, this Europe tour is like extremely hard for my brain and just for my body and stuff. That I flew straight to uh, America to play a Shikori. Hills in North Carolina and Kentucky. By the way, shout out to the American fan base. Let's fucking go. Y'all really know how to take care of me. Y'all are listening to the podcast. Y'all are giving me big hugs. Like, I, I'm sorry you feel like shit. Um, so I just want to say thank you. But it's amazing. Like when you're just so fucking just in in something. And then when you finally take a day to de- decompress, boom, I get a cold. <laughs> I think your body just is like... All right, adrenaline's gone. Whoosh. Now it's forcing me to chill. So now I'm in a hotel room. I'm on my way back to Denver tomorrow, but I've been watching television. Um, I slept for like 13 hours. Jet lag is real. And, you know, like I, I have a tr- like um, a routine when I'm, I know that I have shows the next day after like a European tour or a Chinese tour or yada, like a world tour and I have to go back to America to get my time changed. I have to stay up for like 24 hours. So it was like, I changed my flight to like 8 a.m. from the Netherlands. And um, I was like, because it was, it was originally at 1, but the one p- if you take a 1 p.m. flight and go minus eight hours, it just fucks, like it fucks your 48 hours because like you're forced to go to bed on the plane and then... um And then you stay up all night and then you're watching just like shitty hotel television, just weird shit that's online infomercials and thinking of like, (laughs) just thinking about your life while everyone else is sleeping, like sleepy, sleepy. So I I did, um, so if you ever are needing to do something after a big travel, they try to get like an 8 a.m. flight, 7 a.m. flight if you're going the other way. If you're going the opposite way, you, you flip it and try to do like a night flight. But that's a little travel knowledge that I've learned after the 15 years (laughs) on the road. But I slept for 13 hours. I did the shows. It was awesome. Had a blast. And then um, while I was going with this, oh, yeah, because it was like your body is just like flushes all that. Like, you know, when you're on adrenaline, you don't really feel like you're sick or anything until you finally have a day to wind down. And you have that day to wind down and all of a sudden whoosh flushes your system with a cold and get the the aches and stuff and just a crazy tour. Um, fucking, of course, you know, at the end of the tour, you know, we fly back from, from Europe and Floyd's leg starts swelling up and he got gout. <laughs> it's like, we came, I was like, I didn't even know what gout was. I thought, you know, it, but then I looked it up. I'm like, Oh yeah, that motherfucker got gout. That guy was just chugging IPAs and, eating, uh, drinking espressos all day. I'm like, I'm surprised I didn't get a gout. Shout out to my body. Really take care of me. My boys, you know, 
My brain gets all fucked up sometimes, but my body is a fucking survivor, man. That my, my body's like, mm, I got you, boy. I got you. When you're when you're feeling depressed, my body's like, mm, I fuck with you. I got you. So shout out to my body one more time. Let's go. You know, a little cold every now and then, no problem. But my body's like, I got you. So shout out to my body. Um, I'm excited. I'll be um, going to Denver. I have like nine days off. I am flying in. I got to finish my record. I have like two songs left I have to do. So I fly to Denver and um, go to uh, and finish the last two songs of the record. And then it's done. Wow. That was hard. <laughs> that was, This record was hard because normally like, you know, real bands, I guess I'm a real band too, but like normal bands will take like three weeks, go live in a studio. But my, you know, my team and my world is like, you know, we, I get overbooked all the fucking time. And uh, so I have to like fill in little days off where I could like finish a song or write a song and yada, yada. And this one beat me up, but I got it done before I, you know, I like to set goals for myself. You know, I think it's, I think goals are important, you know, especially when you're working, when you're based in independent, you know, like your dream, this is your, you're not working for someone. Like I have to like envision and put, you know, I have to drive this ship, you know? So like, I like to put goals in the beginning of the year. Like I, I made goals, like I'm going to pay off my credit card. I'm going to take extra shows so I could pay off my credit card. I'm going to make a new record while I have a little bit of a buzz with the Spotify for my last record. I'm like, I'm not going to wait two years to put out another record and people forget about it. I'm going to just push it and push it through, work real hard, write good songs with great people and push it out. And, you know, it was the, one of the biggest years of the band on our live element. So we had to play like 28 festivals um, or 26 festivals this summer. So I had to get to get all that and get my mind right and make sure all the sets were kind of different. And, you know, it was just a lot of brain power. And then uh, the podcast has taken off. So I had to, um, I made, uh, you know, 40 interviews this year, but like I knew that I could do it all. That's the amazing thing about your brain. You know, if you just like focus on how to departmentalize, maybe that's the word, your brain into like when you're spending time on one thing, just spend time on that thing. I know you have like 20 other things going on, but if you just spend that energy just working on that one thing until that project's done and then move on, you get less overwhelmed. But I just got, I just want to clap for myself because I got everything done this year. Right before the fall tour, I'm like, I'm not doing interviews. I'm not, I want to just focus on, because fall tour is really important for like the fans to have a great show. And I don't want to be overstressed and I don't want to show that to the fans. So I finally got everything done. And um, so we're going to have a great fall tour. <laughs> Basically, I was telling myself, I'm like, you know, I, I don't like being overwhelmed. That's one thing. I, I, could, I could handle doing a lot of work. I could handle just fucking, I could handle a lot of work. I just don't like when a lot of work is all coming at once, you know? So I like to um, put everything in their categories and I'll work on, work on, work on. And then I feel accomplished. So um, I'm basically, that was seven minutes of me telling my brain that um, um, I'm all right. <laughs> you know, it's hard to uh, tell yourself that you're all right. You know, you could tell everyone else they're all right or you could give all the advice to the world, to other people. But when do we ever take a step back and give advice to ourselves. Not really a lot. Or pat yourself on the back without being called a narcissist or without, you know, having people think you're crazy because you want to celebrate yourself for a second. But it's important to celebrate yourself, I think. I don't know about you, but like, if we give so much to everyone every single day and we don't leave enough for ourselves then the following year, we're still at an empty tank. <laughs> so we have to realize that we're trying, that we're doing the best we can. And we have to realize that if we're going to give all these other people, you know, all the, the, the length in the world to fuck up and stuff, then we should do that for ourselves and be proud that we made it through another year. Oh, sorry. We made it through another year, you know? Life is hard. It's extremely hard. So be better to yourself. And um, don't, uh, 
How do I say this? Without sounding sad, because I'm not really sad right now. But just be, um, be proud of yourself. Because life is hard. It doesn't matter what situation you're in. Poor, um, rich, um, in the middle of your dreams, fulfilling your dreams, thinking about what to do next. Life is hard in general. Just to survive is hard. I talked to my parents. I talked to my mom. And she was bummed out that I got arrested. And, uh, you know, I think about her. She's like, she's, all she's thinking about is me right now, which is so beautiful. When she's like going through chemo and, uh, you know, with her blood cancer and she's getting older. And, but she thinks about me when she's going through all that stuff. We need to take a step back and think about ourselves for a second. So in this moment, take a deep breath. And uh, whatever else is going on in your world, other people you're taking care of, just forget it for one second. And just think about yourself and be proud that you're fucking out here in these streets fucking following dreams. I hear you, bands. Let's go. A lot of bands listen to this album. A lot of bands listen to this album. A lot of bands listen to this podcast. And be proud that you're following your dreams. Anyone out there dream following, even if you're not dream following, if, you, if your dream is to um, have the best family ever or take care of your kids, fuck yeah, that's still a dream. That's no different than me, uh, you know, busting my dick in, you know, bullshit cities in Europe. It's all the same. Life is going to be hard. And um, just be proud that you're trying. Because what, what else is there? What else there to do? The opposite of trying is giving up. And that's not fun. Unless you really <laughs> are just over it. But I don't want you to be over it. Life is um, too precious. I don't want you to regret anything. Because we don't know for what happens when we die. We don't. It could be just darkness and fucking boringness. Or it could be heaven or hell or maybe 20 virgins with titties. and Or, you know, for the ladies, big old dongs. Whatever. <laughs> it could be. But just in case there isn't. Let's just appreciate this. Appreciate the beauty of the shit show that is planet Earth. <laughs> wow, it's fucked up out there. It is. You know, with the wars and everyone not trusting each other anymore and, you know, Putin calling Americans uh, Satanism, or I just read this because they don't want to be considered genderless. Like, how fucking ignorant is that? It's just so ignorant. So don't let any of these people, even like if you're gay or maybe you want to get out of a relationship, you've, you know, you're in that doesn't feel right and it might make your friends uncomfortable or whatever, yada, yada. You got to start doing stuff for yourself again. That's the most important thing. This is why I'm out here, another <laughs> weird ass town, taking a day off because I know when I go back to Denver, I have to deal with all that stuff, my other life. So I like, if you got to isolate, isolate, get your brain right. Be proud of yourself. If you're going to isolate, don't dread about shit. Take that day of isolation to be proud of who you are as a person. Okay, that's it. That's my sermon. Um, we got Lola Kirk on the show, actress from uh, Mozart in the Jungle. I think it's called Mozart in the Jungle. I did this interview a while ago before this tour. But it was cool. I liked her. She's now, she's on a Jack White's label. She's doing music. And she's cool. She's, uh, she was cutting it forward with me. You know, it's like, I could tell she was a little burnt out during this interview. She was probably doing press all week for her new record. And, uh, you know, she was just kind of over it. So we talked, we got, instead of talking about music, we just talked about um, the jadedness of the industry. And I, you know, that's the type of shit I like. You know, I don't want... I don't want you to sugar, I don't want to sugarcoat. I want you to be honest how you feel. And that's why I'm doing this podcast. Cause I don't want to, the minute that it feels like we are just lying to ourselves just to promote stuff, it's, um, just doesn't feel genuine. So I'm glad we had a great talk here. So you're going to enjoy this Lola Kirk episode. I got fall dates, little stranger. It's coming up next week. We start our tour first weekend is let me see if I can remember this. Um, 
I think first night's Austin. Second night is Dallas. Then we go to the Wichita Falls, Texas. Then Springfield. No, no, no. Then Ar- Fayetteville, Arkansas. Springfield. And I can't remember where we're going during the weekend. But grab your tickets. We're co- it's, um, I'm stoked. A lot of people are coming out. I really appreciate all the support, um, especially the towns where I've played in this town like four times <laughs> with the festival circuit. You know, it's like a lot of festivals are in the Northeast and a lot of festivals are over like three hours away from each other. And now I'm coming back to those areas during the fall. And uh, I just appreciate all the support you guys give me. I love y'all. We're going to try to make it new. We're going to try to make it fresh. We have all these new songs. We have all this new stuff that um, I'm going to bring to the table. And we got some, we made up some new bits <laughs> in Europe. I think you're going to enjoy them. Man, it was getting gay in Europe. Woo! Me and Floyd. Basically, we have done we did everything but fuck each other on stage. <laughs> it was getting close. We were, I mean, you know, it's like when you just like, you live in a dream world for a couple weeks and all of a sudden like, you forget that there's reality and like, <laughs> I almost, we almost like made out on stage. There's like a point in one of the Europe shows where we were shirtless and he jumped on top of me. And I just was thinking of that moment in Dirty Dancing where Patrick Swayze is like, I had the time of my life. And she's, he's holding the girl and they're staring in each other's eyes. I'm like, oh my God, this is what's happening. But shout out to Floyd. Hope he gets his gout better. Let's go. Floyd working hard. Whole band working hard. We are fucking working hard. Tired. But we're doing it because music is important. You know, we're uh, beating ourselves up. I was like, people like sometimes um, misinterpret my Mondays like, oh man. It's like, we're like, we're destroying ourselves. It's like, it's not that we're like, well, we are drinking, but we're not like, super belligerently drinking. We only power drink for like two or three hours. We're not drinking all day. It's mostly just like the hard living of being a musician. It's hard living. A lot of people aren't going to understand how hard a living it is besides the people doing it. That's why, you know, I'm here for you musicians out there, all these new bands out there and fucking butt fuck to Kipsy or whatever, playing a Tuesday for the all you can eat rib night or whatever, <laughs> getting 300 bucks and sleep into your car. We hear you, buddy. And um, we're all been there. And uh, just keep fighting. Because one day you'll look past to it. And you'll be in a nice hotel. In, in the same shitty town. <laughs> so um, just keep fighting. I'm here for you. I know the life of a musician is hard. And I know that no one's going to get it. Not even your managers. Not even your booking agents. You know, they could say they get it. But they're out there just doing their, you know, you know, I call it, um, you know, being a captain from their computers. They're not going to understand how hard it is, but I do. I know you do. And you, you're, you're working hard and I can feel you. So I'm here for you guys. All you upcoming bands, if you, uh, your managers and agents don't get it, hit me up. We'll, uh, we'll have a therapy session. Okay. I was, I was supposed to only do 10 minutes, but then I went on this rant, <laughs> but, um, okay. Enjoy Lola Kirk. Enjoy your week. Um, don't be so hard on yourself. Be who you want to be. It's okay to say no. It's okay to get out of things that don't make you comfortable anymore. And it's okay to um, be honest. And if that's the things we could get out of this week, I think that's good. No big goals. Just uh, pat yourself on the back sometimes and um, let them know that you're trying. All right. I love you. Um, and enjoy Loyal, Lola Kirk and, uh, next week, well, who, who's on the show next week? Oh, that's what I have like eight interviews. I have eight interviews, um, this week that we're going to catch up for the, until we get to the fall, but I'm interviewing some pretty good guests. I got a uh, Sierra hole this week. I got, I'm interviewing modest Yahoo from the house. He's coming over the house. I'm excited for that. I'm interviewing this guy. He's like a legislator that um, makes the rules for drugs. I thought that'd be an interesting thing to ask him about, you know, since I'm always, you know, doing some low-key illegal shit on stage. So uh, that'll be a good one to talk about. And then a couple other ones. Oh, James Casey from Trey Anastasio Band. He's got cancer. And I really wanted, 
I really want to hear his story of how he's fighting for uh, his life right now. He is. It's hard. It's a hard life. Um, and a few others. And make a record. I got a big week. Okay. Well, that's, we're, that's next week. Right now. Focus on yourself. Chill out. Take a breath. Get healed. I'm talking to myself right now. Get healed. Get through this cold that you have right now, as you can hear from my voice, even though it kind of sounds sexy. Like, ooh, yeah. Damn, girl. Got that sexy flu voice. <laughs> okay, I got to be done. I'm done. Um, all right. I love you. I love you. I love you. And you should love yourself. And Andy, love yourself. I do. I love myself. Yeah. All right. Love you guys. Bye. Hey, guys. I totally um, spaced out and forgot to talk about our sponsors during my uh, little opening segment. Dialed in gummies. Yes. The best. I can't wait to go back to Denver and finally get them into my body again. If you are in the Colorado area, go grab some dialed in gummies. They are the best. I'm telling you. I, I'm telling you. I haven't. I've been on the road for a month and I haven't been able to have them in my body and I can feel the difference when I have them in me and when I have them not. Ooh, that sounded hot. <laughs> but grab some dialed in gummies. They're the best. Um, Nick says this big word about them. Homogenize? Yes, they're homo- they homogenize and they are rosin gummies. Homogenize means that Every little bite has the perfect amount of THC in them. So it's not, you're not going to be worried. If you take a half a gummy, you're exactly getting half the dosage. It's perfect, perfect world, and they taste great. And the people who run that place, Keith and the crew, they're just the best. And they've been sponsoring this podcast for almost damn near a year now. So, ladies and gentlemen, go grab some dialed in gummies if you're in the Colorado area. Maybe you have a concert you're going to. Maybe you're going to go see Red Rocks. Go see a gig of Red Rocks or the Mission Ballroom or wherever you are. Dylan Amphitheater, all these great venues in Colorado. Go grab yourself a can of them and have them. They're great for sleeping. They're great for just keeping your vibes right. So grab some dialed in gummies whenever you have a chance. All right, back to the show. All right, next up on the interview hour, we have Lola Kirk. Yes, actress, songwriter. I really, um, I did enjoy her music. I was, uh, I was going into it thinking like, ah, oh, she's an actress, and you know, sometimes just you know, like I want to be an actor. Actresses want to be musicians, yada yada. And I really enjoyed her music. It was really great. It's um, Third Man Records, um, Jack White's record label in Nashville, and she's got some really great songs. Soulful. Um, she's got a great voice, and the lyrics are really good. Um, but I really love her acting as well. She was in Mozart in the Jungle. She was one of the lead roles. I think she was a cellist. And um, I love that movie. I love that show. It was on Amazon. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. Hey, Chris, play a little bit of Lola's uh, music while I talk about her a little more. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed this one. Um, you know, she she was going through press, like I said, in the opening. So um, it was a little short. But uh, we got we got it, and I got what I wanted from it. So, ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy on the interview hour, Lola Kirk. Lola Kirk, oh, how I you won't doing? make you jealous then. Yeah, oh, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Where you at? I'm in Nashville. Oh, oh yeah, you got a record coming out, right? Or did it just come out? It came out on Friday. Yes, it came out on Friday. Let's fucking go! There she is. Yeah. Thank you. I've been waiting for that moment this whole time, this whole weekend. What's the difference between um, like a release week for an album versus like a, re- a release week for like a show or being an actor? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that the onus falls a lot more on independent artists than it does on actors uh, mm-hmm. to promote. So you're kind of, at least in my experience just like promoting yourself as much as possible on social media. Whereas like a press junket that you do for a TV show, you're still like out there all the time, but you're kind of being like handled by people. Uh And uh, I don't know. It's, it feels, I I think being an actor is more infantilizing generally. Right. um, And being a musician is more humiliating. (laughs) So, (laughs) <laughs> which what what uh which one can you handle more in, inside yourself? You know, I don't I think that the humiliation is a little bit more like 
helps you grow and evolve more than the infantilization does. Why do you say that? Because like, and, and, and look, I think infantilization happens on all levels of all, or, or all in, in all industries at a certain level, um, which is why you have so many like celebrities who like, you know, act like children basically right. and act out all the time. Um, but yeah, I think that like, I, my experience of being on a set all the time is that like, or when I'm on set, it's like, there are these production assistants that like basically ferry you from point A to point B mm -hmm. and like, you know, get you lunch and get you dinner. And, and that's like, you get, get kind of used to it because you can't really do anything without someone else helping yeah. you to do things. Um, and I don't know. I just, I don't think that that, that creates like the healthiest uh, relationship to being alive. Whereas I think like what, being handled all day. The <laughs> Just yeah, being handy. Yeah, yeah. I don't no, think that it that doesn't. <laughs> of course no, not. it really, really doesn't. And I think that like when you're kind of humiliated as often as you are as a performer, you're like, okay, I have to evolve. I have to grow. I have to mm -hmm. develop a thicker skin and like persevere in spite of adversity. <laughs> right. Do you think uh, you, you think um, humiliation is stemmed off expectations? Hmm. Um, I think it's just a natural, like, uh, consequence of putting yourself out there all the mm -hmm. time. Right. Um, but yes, those expectations are there uh, as well. Um, and, you know, as I was saying, like, you have to put yourself out there all the time right now as a musician to get noticed on really like any level. I mean, that's what uh, social media and music are so kind of inextricably linked at the moment. Right. Um, that it's, it's, it's really confusing. Um, but you know, it's, it, it's a, it's a great tool and it's a miserable tool at the same time. Like it's incredible to be able to have no middleman to reach your audience. Uh -huh. Um, but also like, you know, there are some people who are going to take advantage of that route more than others. And those people are maybe going to find more of an audience. And that seems like how game you are to kind of like be on social media yeah. is really, um, is really, <laughs> I speak mean, I don't mind. blame people who are like, I hate it and don't want to do it. Yeah. What? Speak your mind, Lauren. <laughs> Talk that shit. <laughs> oh yeah. I don't know. I mean, I don't mind it. I've actually really enjoyed like going live and like all of that stuff. Cause I find that people are like nicer than mm -hmm. you think and people are just like excited that like i don't know i mean look when i go live on instagram i find that like a lot of people come and i'm like right because they were just scrolling anyway so yeah. now i'm here like being alive <laughs> and they're yeah. like oh amazing like i understand why people connect with that but it's like window know. shopping I mean, it's just it's a lot of work it's like window yes, shopping it is like window so shopping. like you know like exactly. i like shopping walking around going to a shop see, oh maybe buying something versus like Oh, I know exactly what I want. I'm going to Amazon to go check it out. You know? So true. So true. I mean, it's it's a lot more of a exploratory experience, but Well, that's why we know. like live I shows. I, you know? It's the surprise, yes, the live true. surprise. Right. Yeah. It's pretty I, I've been really enjoying playing live recently too, for that very reason. Just like actually and and it's funny because I feel like I'm like connecting with people that I've connected with on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Like it's like kind of like I used to go in chat rooms a lot when I was a kid in the 90s. Like what kind? Because I found them thrilling. Oh my God. Ones I definitely shouldn't have been in. And what I was, was like, like the kinkiest people. ones you're you're into. What was the oh, kinkiest chat? I mean, <laughs> I, I, I feel like I didn't like go in specifically looking for any kind of kink, but I would engage in conversations with people. And then like moments later be like, oh my God, uh, I don't know what that word means. And then I'd have to ask my family and they'd be like, what have you been doing? And I'd be like, nothing. <laughs> um, but I feel like I was asked the question ASL a lot, which I don't know if people know what that means it's anymore, like, but it's age, sex, location. Oh, I thought it was the... Like the click. No, it's not DSL. Oh, okay. Oh, ASMR. ASMR. That's dick sucking lips. ASMR. You know, whatever. There's so many um, acronyms these Damn, days. Damn. So you're like an innocent <laughs> catfisher. <laughs> I was in, in a, I just longed to be connected, I suppose, with people. Well, let's talk about and that. And I would like, yeah, right. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Because, you know, it's like, 
what were, what was going on in your childhood that you couldn't have friendships that way? Or did you like being a stranger in someone else's conversation? Oh, wow. Such a profound question. <laughs> and fortunately for you, I haven't been to therapy yet this week, so well, I probably have a very loaded answer for that. <laughs> let's fucking go. Um, let's go, Lola. I'm here for you, let's girl. Let's fucking go. <laughs> Oh my God. Love the applause. Thank you. I'm here to pump you um, up. I love that. I love that for us. Um, what was going on? I mean, I was the youngest by a long shot in my family. My family was pretty dysfunctional and chaotic. Yeah. So there was probably something even, um, you know, warm and comforting about a, a screen <laughs> right. uh, with a bunch of text on it and a bunch of strangers being interested in me or this fake version of me. And also, I don't know, I've always just really liked talking to people. Um, So those conversations were kind of exciting and fun to me. I mean, I remember I I even invited someone to Jamaica once with no intention of going. I was like nine years old. I was like, let's go. And they were like, yo, 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 while I'm buying a ticket now. You are a catfisher, dude. (laughs) You are on MTV. I was a total catfisher. Do you think you felt it was dysfunction because, you know, your dad, your dad was a drummer, bad company, right? Or Yes. And then your your mom was an actress or a writer. What was your mom? No, I, my mom uh, is a designer. She, she had a vintage clothing store in the West Village for years called Geminola, which was a hybrid of me and my sister's and my brother's name. Um, and she also like designed houses and stuff. Um, so maybe, very, very colorful. Yeah. Keep going. Sorry. I interrupted you. Very colorful. What? Oh, very colorful, uh, life, <laughs> um, in, in, in the West village in, in Manhattan, which was, you know, I mean, it was, it, it looked great and there were a lot of great things about it as well. Um, but also, you know, I mean, when you're raised by two artists and then all the children are artists as well, it's really mm-hmm. not it's it's not always going to be that that pretty. Yeah. Do you think it's like it rooted from them being focused on their art versus being focused on you? Uh, Yeah, I mean, I think yes. And I think that like the other side of being an artist is like. um being uh very concerned with yourself and self-conscious in a way that i think people who aren't making art aren't as much (laughs) like i think there's tremendous value in like having like real jobs which like i didn't know anybody with a real job like i mean not that it's not a real job to be an artist and make a living that way but like it's it's a really different life path than than saying, you know what, I'm going to go and do something from nine to five. And then whatever my hobby or my passion is, I'll cultivate that later. Um, so I think that it breeds a certain kind of, of person that isn't always like the easiest to deal with. And also like it's when, when that, when that dream comes true for people, when your art does become your life, like you're kind of living a fantasy and living a fantasy is great and everything, but it's still, it's not reality. So yeah, totally. I don't feel that I grew up entirely in reality. Hence why you're catfishing. This all makes sense now. Hence why I, yes, exactly. That's, thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad that we discovered that together. It's, you know, it's like you wanted to feel normal and have these weird hobbies maybe. Right, right, and invite people to Jamaica. Yeah, fuck her. Clap to that. Let's go. Let's go, Lola. <laughs> Let's go. Get your kick off. Get your kinks out. So, I mean, your whole, your family, your sis, your sister. Do you have a brother too, or two sisters? I have two sisters and one brother. So it's like it feels like everyone being an artist. You know, people talk about not comp- competing, but I think that's bullshit. Was it competitive? Uh, it was, and it, and it is, yeah. and that sucks. Yeah, that honestly. sucks. Um, could you have a real yeah, relationship I mean, with your siblings with all the competitiveness going around? <laughs> uh, yeah, I just think it's a different relationship. I mean, it's not as supportive uh, always as I, as I would like. And I often wonder how I can be more, um, a part of that solution, Um, but yeah, I think that, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm in my feelings a lot about all of this right now and trying to find like a realistic path forward about how to be like loving with 
with a group of people that I, I do love so much, but I think that, um, it's, I think that it's certainly taken a toll on, on, on us as a, as a family unit to all be in pursuit of, uh, artistic careers. Oh yeah, I agree. It's, I mean, my family, all I think about is money. So it's like, and they're all real estate brokers. Oh, okay. And so stuff. you get it. I get that <laughs> shit. Yeah, yeah. And I was the yeah, artist, okay. or it took me a little longer to make money. So I was like, always like the, the bastard child a little bit. You know, it's like I don't yeah. know. Were you who was the first uh, member of your family that started popping off besides your um, mom and dad? Uh, my sister, my sister Jemima uh, was on Girls, the HBO show. Um, oh hell yeah! And that. And that was totally hard for me. I mean, I was in college and I had wanted to be an actress and and my sister who had always been a painter suddenly was having this incredible success. And I was like, oh my God. Um, so I'm not like, I'm not uh, immune to feeling somebody else's success be like my own failure. Um, but I do think that there's like a tremendous amount of work that you have to do to be like loving and supportive of people who are experiencing success and to not like take it personally. Um, and you know, that is something that I think is more difficult, maybe for women, maybe not though. I, I think that like, there's a scarcity mentality mm -hmm. um, that makes it seem that way. And like when you're pitted against each other in a certain way by society, that can be, um, that can be made <laughs> yeah, even, fuck. even worse. Especially when you're, you're, you're being pitted from your sibling, like you have nowhere to go. Yeah. I know it's 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 true it's true I mean I have a song on my record um called Broken Families which is definitely about like how we we bring um these kind of like more uh, less less healthy dynamics from our family lives and to our other relationships and that's also something that I'm like and, and then and then like how attempting to break that pattern can be so difficult um but I do really want to break that pattern. Right. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, like what that would take. Um, like, does it mean how, how, how can you actually break these patterns that are ingrained in you from such a young age? And today, I mean, I think that like we live in a world that definitely mimics, uh, I, I you know, these, these values that I was raised around and like, social media is, is such an incredible way to like take a big shit on yourself. If that's your right, vibe, exactly. <laughs> there are some people though, it's there true. are some people though, like I was reading this article in the Atlantic that said that like social media is not like rat poison. Like it's not necessarily bad for everybody. It's more like alcohol. Like some people can't handle it and other people can. Right. So, you know, God bless those people that can totally handle it. Um, but I cannot. <laughs> um, and like, I I took a week off of it recently and was just like, oh my God, I feel incredible. I feel fine. Right. I'm reading things that are good <laughs> yeah. instead of like my own comments or whatever. And today I was just like, I'm not going to go on it. I have somebody that posts for me. Thank God. <laughs> because, But now, but I did this thing where I hired someone to post for me because you have to as, you know, when you're promoting a record or something. And then I would go on and like read all the comments yeah. and like check all. And I was just like, what's the point? Why? I'm like now throwing money away. So yeah, you might I'm as well post like, yourself. <laughs> may as well post yourself. Yeah. What's the point? Um, so today I'm like trying to like step back from it just because like, I can't, it, it's just a comparison machine mm -hmm. if, if, if that's how you're wired. Um, so that's part of how I'm choosing to break the cycle today in my own, in my own life. I mean, yeah. And it's like a, it's just like a, a vicious circle of going back to your childhood when it's like, you're, you're looking for <laughs> acceptance from your siblings that you did something good in your art. Wow. I mean, you just, <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to hang up now. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm like, it's too early. Oh, I started, no, no, no. I started I having, know, that's, what it all, it's what it's all about. Are you in Los Angeles? I, I grew up in LA. York, right? I grew up in LA. I live in Denver okay. now. I'm a musician and the scene. Oh, you live too. in Denver. Denver. I live Amazing. in Denver now. 
Yeah, I, I couldn't. I my love parent, Denver. Denver's great. You know, I got out of L.A. because of the same feeling. I, I felt like I was just being judged. I'm like, my friends weren't actually my friends. They are just jealous that I was actually doing shit. And that no one could actually have, like, this real relationship. You know, and it, it made me not be able to love myself. And it took me 30 years, 30 plus years to love myself. I mean, I think growing up in these big cities is great and it sucks because it feels like you're in competition all the time. You know, you don't have that in fucking Dickipsie, Iowa or whatever. You know? Yeah, right, right. I mean, it definitely. Yeah, I would say that, like, I grew up around in such a magical world where, like, everybody was, like, creative and an artist. And then, like, I look around and I'm like, nobody holds a real job <laughs> uh, that I grew up around. Like, nobody. And, like, if they – and, if and, and like, I don't hold a real job either, so I'm not, like, one to talk. I've been, like, extremely fortunate to, like, have – success in my career where that's not what I, you know, I don't, I don't have one, but like, also it's just like, it, it, it is a fantasy. Like New York and LA, I think are like fantastical towns to grow up in right. that like will really instill a lot of really weird values in people. If you grow up in that in, in a certain way, I mean, I, maybe that's not true for everybody. I, I don't know. I'm very, I'm very curious about it though right now because I'm, you know, I'm 31 and I'm beginning to be like, what relationships can I move into my adulthood? With? Right. What ones serve me? And like, what relationships do I like roll my eyes about? Like constant, like I'm on the phone with people sometimes and all I'm doing is rolling my eyes and I'm like, I'm insane. Yeah. Why don't I? <laughs> well, which <laughs> like, relationships you do you want? do that to people. Which relationships do you want to keep in I your want, life? I mean, I want relationships in my life that are, and I want, this, these are the three things I want from everything in my life. I want love and loyalty and longevity. Not always. If I don't want it forever, then like, you know, maybe that's okay. You can just enjoy things for a little bit, but like right. I I don't I don't want like high drama and uh I don't I don't know. I just I really want like a, a truly loving relationships and I know I have to give all of those things to me first. And uh that's that's hard. So I'm I'm yeah, may maybe that's it's why like, I moved to Nashville. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, well, you're moved to Nashville. Oh yeah, Third Man Records. Oh yeah, yeah, Third Man Records. They're, third Man uh, Records. Yeah, yeah. You're on the Third Man. You're in the Third Man cult. I forgot. Um, it, yeah, <laughs> it is. It's a fucking cult, and you're you're, you're drinking the Kool Aid. I love, I love, it. love it. Yeah, I mean, I love Nashville. Yeah, that's what I'm drinking right now. <laughs> the Third Man. Oh, it's is that a, the it's third? It's kind of a, a Denver of sorts. Yeah, like a smaller city that has a lot going on for it. Yeah. Yeah, you know it's um. I agree. I think Nashville is the perfect city where you get a little bit of the city, but you also get these like Southern values. You're going to deal with a lot of bullshit, all these like country promoters who think they're the shit, but you're also going to have some real genuine friends. I feel in Nashville. I love Nashville. Yes, I do. I, I have some great friends here. Um, I want to talk more about loving yourself. <laughs> okay, <laughs> if you don't let's mind. Do it. Okay. So, you yeah, know, no, please. I, you know, we you, we'll talk, I want to talk about your career as well, but like, I, I relate to you on this and I don't know what it is that it, it makes us hard to love the things we're doing that we have to like get satisfaction off of people telling us we're all strangers telling us we're awesome on social media. Where do you think it triggers from? I mean, I know where it triggers from. I, I just, <laughs> I think you nailed it. It's like, you know, you want the love of the kind of foundational people in your life. And when you don't feel that you've had it, you kind of go and seek it out elsewhere. Um, I know that there's some 12 step programs for that. <laughs> and I should <laughs> probably be in them. Um, but yeah, I think that it's addictive and you get, you get high off of that like little hit of approval, but then with each high comes a little low as yeah. well. And it's just not sustainable. Um, so I don't know. I've been, I was talking to my friend who microdoses a lot yeah. <laughs> and she's like such an incredible resource of, um, of wisdom to me. And I mean, she was just like, I'm just tapping into the source now. Cause I'm not I, like the source of divine love. Like she was like, that's what I experienced when I, you know, microdose. And, and that's what I realized. That's where I realized it's really got to come from. So I, I think I want to get on that, on that tip. Um, and kind of like demystify this this value that that uh, social media has kind of um, 
you know, taken on in my life. Like, it's just, it's not, it's not real. No, it's another fantasy. It's and like, I want to live in reality. Yes. So it's not there. And I mean, I don't know. I was on my phone. I smoked a little bit of pot last night and I was like, I couldn't put my phone down. It was kind of fascinating to see how <laughs> unable I was to, to part with it. And I was like, I hate this thing right. so much. Oh. Um, I mean, of course, Roe v. Wade got overturned, so that was also something worth looking at. Yeah, um, fucking, I can't believe so. that. That's insane, dude. Our country yeah. is fuck. I mean, I can. But no, <laughs> it, it, like, but yeah, yeah, of course. It's crazy. Yeah, but like, you know, they, uh, they, yeah, they, they turn, they turn Roe v. Wade, and then all of a sudden, there's the Met Gala going on, where all the fancy rich people are all just like, who? You know, it's like this country is so fucked yeah. up sometimes. You know, it's like I know so there was a great tweet that I saw that was like, everybody was watching the Amber Heard Johnny Depp trial and what like, and nobody was paying attention to <laughs> this like ongoing battle that's been happening. And you know, it's yeah. very true. Roe um, v. Wade, Heard v. Depp. Yeah. Heard v. Depp. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, this country Jeez. is disgusting. <laughs> but it, we're here to promote. It really, so really is. Let's promote. Let's promote. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's, I mean, you know, I made a record called Lady for Sale, which I think ties very much into this entire conversation. Um, For one, because like, it's very much about like the price of fame and the price of the pursuit of fame and recognition. Um, But also, and also how often that is like, you know, selling yourself and um, kind of giving up ownership over your body and, and, and your life. Um, I mean, like, for example, when you get like an amazing contract <laughs> to, yeah. to sell hair care or skin care or whatever, which I have not had, but I'm like, I would, I would love one. Well, <laughs> My like hair a, is really, really nice. Like a Lord, <laughs> like a, like a, a sure. Pantene Pro V or whatever. Sponsor. Yes, yes. Okay. One of those things. I mean, look, honestly, I know this is a podcast, but like my hair got really, really long during COVID. My my head hair and my armpit hair got super long. Grow it out, COVID. girl. But anyway, I'm like, I will yeah, grow it out. Um, but yeah, like you you are selling the image of your body um to like make money, be relevant, and whatever. And then like, I don't know, I had a friend who was a sex worker. Um and we went to like a a, a march <laughs> um, that was like for sex workers, right? She's actually, interestingly enough, completely turned on on like sex work and and now says it's the worst thing ever. But anyway, the, I went with her and she was like, you know, a lot of my friends say that you shouldn't be here. And I was like, oh, and she was like, but I say that you're a sex worker too. I mean, you sell your body and your soul and your heart for money all the time because you're an actress. And I was like, <laughs> wow, I never thought about it like that. And I don't know that I wholly agree with it, but I also don't not agree with it. Like, yeah. you know, you are, you put yourself up for sale when you, when you pursue a career in the arts, not when you're an artist, because you can be an artist without having a career in the arts. You don't need to, you don't need to ask this thing to, to be lucrative or sustainable in your life, um, financially. But yeah, I, I, I definitely think that it's, um, it's a really hard row to, I don't know what I was going to say there, but anyway, I, I just like, I, I am very perplexed by the role of women's bodies in art and in culture at the moment. Yeah. I mean, I could, I mean, yeah. And also like I've been watching your promos and stuff and it's just like your naked butt and stuff and it's cool. I like, <laughs> you know, it's like, well, I mean, yeah, we were doing all of that. Look, it's all tongue in cheek. Like yeah. the whole concept was not, um, was not like, oh yeah, we're just gonna, it's, it's not earnest. I read, I read a review cause I do that. Cause I, I, you know, I'm a masochist and the review was so like, she, it's so crazy that she like, you know, looked to nineties country as an inspiration to like help her kind of resolve her feelings about um, like the commodification of the female body, because country is so like guilty of that, of, of the same thing that Hollywood is. And I was like, I know, like, that's the point. Oh. Like I'm interested in these, I'm interested in these kind of um, aesthetics that, that use women's bodies 
to kind of, uh, against them, but also create amazing platforms for women to be empowered. I mean, like country singers, women country singers in particular, have some of the most like powerful positions I've I've ever um, perceived and have and have made me feel powerful when I listen to them because I relate to them. And, and I've seen women in Hollywood do the same thing. Like yeah. I don't watch every movie and go like that poor woman. I'm like, wow, like that woman's kicking ass. She gets to be an amazing artist and gets to make a ton of money or, yeah. you know, give a great performance, whatever it is. So I think using using difficult medium or idea to ideas to comment on things is I don't know. I think it's cool. I do too. And <laughs> tell Pitchfork to suck it from the back. If it was Pitchfork, <laughs> yeah, seriously, what a backhanded compliment about the 90s country oh bullshit. Like, fuck you, Pitchfork. They don't like, get it. They don't get It's okay. They don't get it. Uh, they don't get I it. Hate I mean, their reviewers. biggest thing was that I do too. I do too. But the biggest thing about this review to me that was so interesting was like, they were like, she's from New, she's from New York. So why is she making country music? And I was like, did Pitchfork just call me pretentious? I know. Because I'm honored. As they write their fucking, <laughs> as they write their article from New York City. Tell them to suck it from the back, Lola. I, Jesus. I, I can't, know. I'm so I don't know what these. suck it from the back means, but I'll Google it later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but you know. I know. This is the thing about, it goes back to the illusion of social media. It's the illusion of someone yeah, telling right. us that, hey, your record's good. Or it's so weird because like it feels like you're circling back to the trap of when you used to act and you're you're pretending to be someone else too. Well, I mean, yeah, I I think that that's a really powerful thing to do. And I talk about this a lot to myself, which is like the I mean, I think that there's a difference between like an inauthentic self, which is something that I am striving to get away from, but also like employing archetypes to get at authenticity. Like that is the kind of like, I mean, there are archetypes in literature and in theater because those those kind of general ideas made it very easy for somebody to enter into something deeper. And so like choosing to play the role of like a nineties country singer (laughs) or choosing to play the ingenue or the vixen or anything like helps people enter into something deeper and therefore understand like a more, I believe, um, complicated idea, make things simple. So people can understand something more complicated about themselves or, or something else. Um, and and yeah, I, 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 I'm interested in those archetypes yeah, and using them intelligently and not just like, I don't know. I mean, I struggle to, to kind of put myself out there as just, as just me. I don't know what that is. I think that's a very in flux or fluid idea. So I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, I, and I have fun with genre. I mean, yeah. I think it's, it's a good time to kind of explore those different things. Yeah. And like, Oh God, don't get me started with these reviewers. Like what offends you more? You know, you're a great actress. You're fantastic in Mozart in the jungle and fantastic. So what, I appreciate that. When someone shits on your art via being an actress versus being a musician, which one do you take more offensively? Well, I think I will say, honestly, all the bad reviews that I've read have actually been like really good reviews. <laughs> they yeah. just like they none of them have said like she can't sing, she can't write. They're all just like she did something really bold and I don't like it. And I'm like, that's fine. Oh, so God. I would say like a, a bad review of my music would hurt me more, but ultimately, like, as long as they're not like saying I I I fit like they're saying I succeeded, but they don't like that. Right. <laughs> um, it's but like I, I don't know, and I feel like in movies or TV, like I've never really, I've never personally gotten like a bad review that I know of. Um, but like the projects that I've been in have definitely been like panned. Yeah. <laughs> and as long as, and I, I kind of jump ship. I'm like, well, as long as they said I'm good, you know, like I don't really care. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah I'm, i guess i'm selfish that way no i mean we're all competitive in our own way you know it doesn't matter if we hide it or i think a little bit of competitiveness is good for you know our drive you know sometimes i'm trying to exercise my competitive demons though like if i'm just really honest about it yeah because i know some people are like i'm not a competitive person i'm like 
Oh my God. You are fucking like, lying. Who were your parents? <laughs> <laughs> you, you liar. <laughs> um, but I guess like I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to own that and, and move and move forward and talk about it as much as possible. And yeah, I mean, my competition though, has been such a big part of my drive right. and it's really fun to find artists that you can kind of have like a artist friends that you can have a healthy competition with. Hell yeah. Um, yeah. It's nice. And, and cause they are, they are, they do exist. That's it's not like artists can't be friends because right. blah, blah, blah. I think like people sometimes can't be friends because they haven't figured out how to relate to each other yet. Yeah. Um, but you can have amazing relationships with other artists. And that's something that I've really been trying to seek out is like find artists who can be mentors, whether they're older than you in real life or in, in career life or something like that. Right. Just find people who have experience and perspective that inspires you yeah. and and makes you feel, <laughs> um, you know, it, like like there's hope in yeah. in in these often very bleak looking worlds. I mean, I didn't like anyone's outfit at the Met Gala last night. Was <laughs> I was kind, watching it. I was just like. It. They're so boring. Like that's the most. If that's like what high fashion has to offer right now. I don't want it. Were you ever I mean, invited to the Met Gala? Oh my God, no. I was just about to say, I would love <laughs> to go. <laughs> <laughs> Hate on, player. Hate but on. But until I'm invited, I don't want to go. I uh, know. Yeah, they better <laughs> invite you. I'm not going to beg for it, you know. I'm not going to beg, but you know, I would totally go. <laughs> oh my God. So you're... you're. And I would wear something so cool. So I'm insane. What were you saying? No, I, I was like, you are my inside source to both worlds right now. You're in... You, you got the New York vibe, you got the actress vibe, and now you're becoming the musician yeah. vibe, which is fucking badass. And I'm, I'm a big fan of you, Lola. And Thank I saw, you. I'm, you know, one of my favorite shows right now is Winning Time. And you fucking kill it in that. Oh, yeah. I, I was going to say, because you've got the little Lakers show. Oh, I'm a diehard. I got Kobe on my arm. I got Jerry. I got Jerry Buss. Oh. I mean, I'm a diehard Laker fan. You have a Jerry Buss tattoo? That's my goat. That's my idol. Wow. Yeah. Is that, that's where you got suck it from behind from? <laughs> no, Jerry would say something <laughs> a little more profound than suck it from the behind. Right, right, right. But you played um, um, Jerry West's wife. And, yes. And yes, you I did played Jerry um, West's wife. You know, and he's kind of pissed off about that show. Was Jerry that big of an asshole? I mean, I read his autobiography, West by West. Uh -huh. I think it's called, the subtitle is A Charmed and Tormented Life. And, and I mean, he seems kind of like a really profound and amazing guy. Right. I'm not surprised he's not interested in a portrayal of his life um, because, you know, he's very kind of principled. That yeah. was like, he's principled and also like struggles or really struggles with manic depression and right. I think bipolar disorder. So, I mean, I, I think that he's just like very like, I don't like this and, right. and, and they can suck it from behind. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. There we go. We got a um, okay. So you're an inside, you, you're my inside scoop in, in the actors. Who's more competitive? Who's more pieces of shit actors or musicians? Um, God, that's such an interesting question. I mean, I just don't, I don't know if there's a, I think everyone is, I think it's, <laughs> I think it's just like more of a, yeah, I don't, I mean, actors, I will say actors have more of like a collaborative spirit. Sometimes I'll find, mm -hmm. I mean, it really depends too, though. Like if you're like, I know so many actors who are like incredibly supportive and kind and like generous and like that's maybe like more of a drama school actor because yeah. they like really understand like what it is to be part of thespian. an ensemble or whatever yeah. a thespian but then i would say that like musicians obviously have that too i think it's more like movie stars and front men but not movie stars because i know a lot of movie stars who are like kind of comfortable with themselves as well yeah because they have but i don't know i mean i just think i just think that it's a personality type right more than like a job necessarily though it was funny when i did mozart in the jungle it was very like clear cut the like stereotypes of different 
kinds of musicians. Like the oboists were like the neurotic ones who like put out <laughs> <laughs> and pianists, pianists like also put like, actually now that I think about it, it was just like everybody puts out <laughs> except for like flautists. Yeah. Those were the people that were like a little more prudes. Those are the prudes. Yeah. yeah. They don't touch me. Yeah. Those are the prudes. What'd yeah. you learn about classical? Are you a flautist? Yeah, I'm, no, oh, definitely not. But I, some days I try uh, to be. Today I'm trying to be more, you know, yeah, I'm a piano I, I, player. You're trying to be more prude. I'm trying to be more God. prude than I used to be, <laughs> definitely. Um, what'd you learn about, you know, making uh, Mozart in the Jungle? What'd you learn about uh, classical music? Because you, you portrayed a musician very well. Were you a musician back then? Were you always a musician? Um, I mean, I always played like guitar <laughs> and, yeah. and sang and wrote songs, but uh, I was nowhere near the level of musician that I portrayed on that show. Um, and what did I learn about classical music was that there was just like an ocean of information that I would never be able to understand <laughs> because yeah, I too, like dude. just didn't grow up learning that kind of music like and i think that i think that like people who understand and play music in that way from a young age like it's like an olympic gymnast like they just are like predisposed to a different capacity for knowledge and understanding of the world than people who aren't um yeah so i i commend and and envy people that like you know, we spent eight hours a day practicing piano or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I wonder what kind of person I would be if I had that like relationship to, to my work. I'm just beginning to practice now to a metronome. Yeah. Um, let's go. Let's see. Which, let's go. I'll let's clap to go. that. I'll clap to that. <laughs> yeah, clap let's to go. That. Thank you. Musician. Let's go. Let's fucking go. <laughs> I'm enjoying it. I have to say I'm enjoying the metronome because when you don't get it, I, I like when I don't get it, I want to punch a hole through a wall. But when I do, I'm like, it's the simple joys in life. Right. And also like practicing is such an incredible thing to do. Right. Like you really can. It does build self-esteem because you're like, oh, I'm improving. <laughs> like, right. I know that they say practice makes perfect, but it's true. Yeah, and if you're fronting a band and, like, you want to do some little bits inside your songs or, like, talk a little bit, it's good to have a little, little, you know, metronome in your head so you could, like, get your beats. Like, you're an actor. You know, you got to get your beats in there. Yeah. So Right, uh, right. So, okay, I got so many questions. Why why become a musician? What was was in your head? What, Um, What happened? I don't know what deranged thought I had in my head. I honestly like got a ukulele in high school, like every white girl in 2006. <laughs> they just like handed I fucking it love to me. Jack Johnson. <laughs> oh my god, no, it was not Jack Johnson. I don't even think I really liked like any kind of music that featured a ukulele. It just seemed like the right next step in my life. Did you like Juno? The right next step towards further alienation from my peers <laughs> uh, to carry a ukulele around. Um, did I like Juno the movie? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I kind of felt it was like more twee than I was. I mean, look, I was a kid from the mean streets of uh, lower Manhattan. So I was a little bit more like advanced. Like I was definitely like doing drugs and getting laid and was just like, you know, fuck what, this. What kind of drugs are you but into? I, I was really just into pot, but you know, there were, I, I was like beginning to experiment with like, mushrooms and acid and you know did you ever get into coke or anything (laughs) uh no i never really got into it i just like i i I, you know i've done it i wouldn't i do not and would not touch it right now because it's so um scary i mean i don't i don't really want to die uh, oh yeah, with maybe all the I'm like being proved by saying, shit. yeah, it just doesn't seem to appeal. But no, I, I I was more just into like smoking copious amounts of weed, mm. like so much weed that I I I probably hurt my brain. But yeah. I do think like I don't smoke pot that much anymore. I know I said I smoked it last night, but I, it's very rare for me to do it. And when I smoke pot, I sometimes feel this like return to self. I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, there's like the goofy sixteen year old in me. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, I, I don't think I really cared that much about Juno the movie. I was definitely jealous of Ellen Page. Yeah, she's definitely. a bad bitch, dude. She's um, badass. Bad bitch. And just, I mean, it was a good movie. Uh, what am I what am I saying? I loved Arrested Development because Michael Sarah's in Juno, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. 
He is. Um, but anyway, so get back yeah, to why you became ukulele. a musician. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Started playing ukulele. Um, I had always kind of known, like, I didn't really know any other girls that played music. Mm -hmm. I loved music. I used to carry a portable speaker around with me everywhere I went and, like, sit on stoops and, like, smoke weed and right. drink 40s. <laughs> um, Hell yeah. And just live that New York City life. Um, and then I just liked music so much. But, I, you know, only boys really played music, even, even in that progressive New York City town. Um, <laughs> And then I went to college and I, I, I had a guitar and I learned how to play the song Angel from Montgomery, the oh, uh, John Ray Pine song. And John Prine. Yeah. But, oh. Yes, yes. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm like really good at playing this song. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's like three. It's four chords. Um, and then from there, the natural progression towards playing like more songs with that many chords happened. Um, and I just... I mean, I don't think nobody was like, you must play music. I mean, I'm sure people were like, you must stop playing music was more the vibe that I was getting from people. <laughs> I remember I would have like parties in my apartment in college. And I had one neighbor tell me that he he was like, he knew it was time to leave when I took my acoustic guitar out. So, And actually, <laughs> this neighbor is like, I just saw him the other night and he loves um, my new album, which yeah. I was like, I have finally arrived. Like yeah. Noah thinks this record is good. And therefore, like, you know, it's come full circle. Were I you spiteful? No, nah, motherfucker. You actually th told me to quit. <laughs> I could have quit. Yeah, no, I was just like, I think I sent him like a fruit basket the next oh, day. Oh, hell yeah. Let's go. Um, well, you, you bad <laughs> bitch, dude. You bad. I like you. <laughs> I like thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, so you, so you yes. what was your first song? What did you write about when you, your first original song and how old were you when you realized, oh, I, I might uh, be able to I do this? I was like 19 when I wrote my first original song and it was like a really sad song. Um, what was it about? And it was actually called, it was about some like whack boyfriend I had, honestly, at the yeah. time. Um, and then what else did I write? I mean, I feel like I wrote like a bunch of songs. I don't know. I, did, I And then I just started writing and I really liked it. And then um, I and then I just kept doing it. And at some point I got the like ridiculous idea that I should try and be a musician and an actress at the same time. How old are you um, there? And like 23. Like, I think I made my first or maybe I'm a little older, my first like EP and in 2015 so i must have been 24 25 what what was um, what was your first gig as an actress uh i did my first movie in 20 2010 i had like a small part in a movie um that was directed by sam levinson which who created euphoria oh, and sick. the movie is basically just like the blueprint for euphoria it's about because i it's about his own life which i think he cast zendaya as him yeah. which is yeah. a genius move yeah euphoria. great move. but anyway it's it's a similar story about yeah i mean i would cast and i'd play me in, in the biopic too oh. but I, I doubt she would say yes <laughs> we'll text her after the, we'll text her after the podcast we'll see what's up yeah yeah, yeah. totally so totally. 2010 so 2006 so you're you're 20 when you got your first gig yes i was 19 or 20 and uh and it was shot in detroit and I went to go see um, Kiss play a concert there, which yeah. was a, a very, um, <laughs> a very cool experience for me. Uh, there was a bodybuilder in the movie and he was my friend that came to the concert with me. And I got to sit on his shoulders while uh, they played Beth. And so I sick. believe Paul Stanley sang it to me. And my boyfriend at the time also believed that Paul Stanley sang it to me. And we got into a really big fight in the parking lot <laughs> afterwards because oh he was jealous. Oh, my God. Why are you so dating sick. these insecure dudes, Lola? Oh, yeah, I don't What know. do you like about you insecure know, you dudes? You learn. <laughs> I, don't, I don't. My my boyfriend now is not insecure at all. Well, That's maybe good. he is. I mean, we're all a little insecure. But, yeah. you know, you, you live and you learn. Okay. Oh, I, yeah, fuck yeah. And we're, we're always going to learn, you know? That's the exactly. beautiful thing about so. life. I hope so too. I don't want to get stagnant. But go back to so you said no. I wanted to be an actor and a musician. So how old were you? Well, here? yeah. I mean, I think that I 
I, 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 I started acting and then started playing music and then decided, but I, but music was always kind of more of a hobby. And then, um, you know, had the kind of, uh, ridiculous idea of trying to make it into not a hobby. And I don't think I wanted to like make money as a musician, which is good because I don't, right. <laughs> I think I just wanted to kind of like play music more, make albums, make, make, um, make, make it into something more concrete than just a hobby. And, um, and so I, and so I didn't, so I have, and, and it's a lot of work. It's a lot, a lot of work. And I think right. when I was younger in my twenties, I was like totally okay with that. Um, and, and, and now I'm like a little more like, how do I do this? But I also think I'm just like wired to constantly be working anyway yeah. Maybe I have a little bit of workaholism, honestly. Yeah. Like I got Same. up at six this morning for absolutely no reason and yeah. just have been working ever since. Yeah. <laughs> and I will continue to work until n the night tonight. Yeah. And then, um, you know, and, 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 and I like it. I mean, I like to stay busy. Yeah, I'm like so that too. So I don't too. have to hear the voices. Yeah, that's the thing. That's what I was going <laughs> to The voices ask. inside my head. Do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because no, I'm, I'm the same workaholic. I wake up at six, start working, and you know, I'm in a band as well. So, and then I do this side, this podcast thing as a side thing. And, um, you know, we do 250 shows a year, so I'm just drinking every day. Oh my day. god! Yeah, it's not. It's I've been I've been doing that <laughs> since I was 15, uh, 15 years old. Yeah. You know, so, or 15 right. years. So, my question is like. You know, do you think being a workaholic is just suppressing your anxiety? Um, I don't know that it suppresses it. I mean, do honestly, you think it, like, like distracts it. Uh, yes. I mean, it definitely does something. Like, I did a little microdose earlier in the week, and I was like, I'm gonna not work. I'm gonna like. I'm not even gonna like. <laughs> I'm not going to try and do anything like interesting. Yeah. Like I'm not going to like dance barefoot outside <laughs> or like do a watercolor. Like I'm going to like try and just like be. And it was like excruciating to do that. I ended up getting into the dog bed with the dog and just looking into his eyes. And then I was like, is this, is this like, do, is this too much? Am I doing too much? Like but me and me and my dog did have like a really good connected moment. It was well, great. Maybe that's the person you want to be is to connect with people. That's why uh, you're... it's well, that is exactly what I want. I mean, to come full circle to my to my days of uh catfishing strangers on the internet <laughs> as a child. Um, yes, I do. I do absolutely want to connect with people and I want to connect. You know, that's what I love about performing live, and I'm sure you understand this. Like, there is something like about human connection which sometimes can feel so daunting because i'm like i don't like people that much they suck and are annoying right. and are disappointing but then i'm like that's just like the lowest self like the high self is like the the highest version of ourselves is the version that we can be through art and can be through you know people that uh consume or witness art i do believe that like through through art or you know just creation we actually get to like be in connection with like each other's highest selves. And that's, that's what I'm really like trying to remember all the time, which is why I'm microdosing so much, you know, I'm, are you taking too much <laughs> for your microdose? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I don't, I don't microdose that much. I, I would I, like to more honestly. You should, man. I feel like, I feel like it might be a good, I have a month off. So I'm like, should I commit to the like three days on four days off vibe? Right. Um, and the answer is probably yes, just to see what it does for me. Yeah. I was having, I had my first anxiety attack, panic attack about five years ago on the road. And I was just doing a bunch of Coke and just doing, you know, one bunch of one night stands and just like I'll do it. not, yeah, just not taking care of myself and, uh, and not taking care of my brain and my heart. Um, and I started microdosing for three years straight. And it was, it got rid, <laughs> it got rid of my depression. I took a 0. 0.7 every day. Yeah. And, uh, wow. I, I took, I took, I was on the five days and two days off, but there's also, do you ever, do you read Paul Stamets at all? You like Paul Stamets? No, let me write that down. Paul Stamets is the mushroom guru or Michael Pollan. You know, Michael Pollan, he's like a health guy, but yes, Michael Pollan. I've heard of. Yes. Yes. Michael Pollan, the health guy who never okay. did drugs, wrote a book about, um, psilocybin, which is fantastic. And I think, interesting. you know, so maybe like, 
you just staring into your dog's eyes means you just took a little too much of a microdose. <laughs> and you could. Sure. Yeah. No, that, that. I mean, yeah, no, that that definitely makes sense. Yeah, but maybe um, that's what your inner self wanted to do this whole time and you distract yourself with work when really you just want to hang out with your dog. I do love my dog so much. Yeah. Well, I love him so much. Well, you're the shit. Lola. Well, I should probably go hang out with him a little bit. Yeah. You know, now that we've talked about it. Yeah, yeah, you should. So I'm, I'm going to conclude this uh, interview now. Um, go buy Lola's record. Uh, it It is... I'm stoked for it. I haven't listened to it yet because it's not out yet, but hopefully I, your publicist... It came will... out on Friday. Go, go ahead and oh, listen fuck. to it. It's Let's out go. everywhere. Okay, cool then. Get it on. Okay. All right. Thank cool. you so much. Yeah, Lola, it's been good so luck fun with to everything. talk to you. Um, and I hope you have a great it's day. It's like free therapy. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, no, I'm going to send you that Venmo. I'm going to invoice you. I'm going to invoice you. <laughs> okay, okay, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll complete it by the end of the day. All right. Okay. Have Bye. A great... Bye, Lola. Great to see you. Thank Thanks you. Bye. All right. There it is. Lola Kirk, everyone. All right. 